starting in verse number 31. It says, in the, mean, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. So they're trying to get him to, he's been in this conversation, they want him to eat something. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. So he's talking about, he's not talking about literally eating. He's just saying, I've got things on my plate that you have no idea. Just, just kind of explaining this bigger picture of why Jesus is here. And of course, they don't understand this. Look at verse 33. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? You know, they're like, he, does, he doesn't have food? Verse 31, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. I always I have those lines, those, those three words, finish his work, underline in my Bible, and I'll explain to you why in just a few minutes. But he says that my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. He's to do the will of the Father. So this kind of, again, demonstrates, you know, this, um, this idea of the Trinity right here, that the Father sent the Son, that Jesus is doing the will of the Father. Jesus, of course, prays in the garden, you know, if, if your will be done, you know, he prays to God, the Father. So we see that difference there. Look at verse 35. He says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth, receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. I'm going to read the next couple verses, and then we're going to cut up these verses tonight. That's what we're going to look at. And herein is a saying, is, a, is that, true say, that saying true? One soweth and another reapeth. Verse 38. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. So in verse 38, we're kind of going to walk this thing backwards, but Jesus is basically saying that I'm going to send you forth to reap. You're going to gather fruit unto life eternal. But then he says this thing where he says, he says, you are going to reap where you bestowed no labor. He's saying, you're going to reap, you're going to bear this eternal fruit where you did nothing. He's like, you're entering into other men's labors. This is talking about other men's labors, first of all. He's talking about going and preaching the gospel to somebody that gets saved, and you have no idea how much work somebody else has done giving the word of God to that person. Maybe you were just the final one to give the gospel to them, and then they ended up getting saved at that point. Or, you know, somebody planted seeds years before is what Jesus is talking about. He's saying this is a whole process, okay? But notice what he doesn't say here. Look, at, look at, up at verse number 34. He's saying you are going to enter into other men's labors. He doesn't say that you're going to enter into God's labor. You're entering into men's labors. So we're going out. He's talking about soul winning. He's talking about preaching the gospel to the lost. And that you're going to be, as you go preach the gospel to the lost, you are going to enter into other men's labors. Because you're not the only one doing it, thank God. And he's saying that there's going to be people planting seeds, there's going to be people watering seeds, and there's going to be people reaping. He's like, you're going to be any one of those at any given time. But notice he doesn't say that you're entering into God's labor. Because in verse number 34, it's interesting, because Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. So God's work of sending Jesus Christ to, you know, Jesus was there to do what? To finish it. So people that believe in works-based salvation, you know what they're doing? They're entering into God's labor. They're entering into God's work. But guess what? The work is already done. Because Jesus came here to finish his work. Verse 34. So yes, as we go out soul winning, we're going to be entering into the labor of many other soul winners. But we are not entering into God's labor. Because that is what works-based salvation is. Works-based salvation is saying, you know what? This work that's already finished... I'm going to add another nail to that house. I'm going to add more work to that. No more work is needed. It's finished. You can't work into that labor because that labor is done. Verse 34. So verse 34 is talking about, it's basically saying Jesus came here to finish this work of granting us salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection. 
And that's not what he's talking about when he says you're going to enter into their labors. He's talking about entering into other people's labors. Right? Look at verse number 36 now. The, the, the purpose of the sermon tonight is to talk about, look at verse 36. It says, He that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. The whole context of the sermon that I want to talk about in these verses tonight is rewards, and God wanting to reward us. So the first thing that we need to see here, look at verse number 35. Verse number 35, it says, Jesus starts out and he says, first of all, he tells him he's, he's there to finish the work of God. And then in verse number 34, or 35, I'm sorry, he says, there are, there are yet four months, and then say not ye, he's saying, don't be like this. Don't be like this saying, there's four months yet, and then cometh harvest. Because what happens? You plant something, and the growing season is about, what, 120 days? That's actually what the growing season is in North Dakota. A little bit less than that, I think. But that's what it takes to grow a wheat crop, for example. You know, you plant something, and then in four months, you're ready to harvest that thing. But Jesus is saying, don't say that. He's saying, don't say that, because there's harvest ready now. There's things, there's, there's white to harvest now. You don't have to wait four months. He says, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. So the first thing that Jesus tells them is the harvest is ready now. Amen. There is, there is fields that are white unto harvest, meaning the, the plant is not green anymore. It dries up and it turns white. This is a, he's, he's using an example of a wheat plant here. It turns white, it dries up, and, and you just get these, they're, they're white golden fields. And that's what Jesus is talking about. You know what he's saying? He's saying, there's people ready to be saved now. Amen. Now, did you know that? I mean, did you know that there's people right here, right now, in Fresno, ready to be saved now? Amen. I mean, look, I mean, you know, we were talking about this, I was talking about this with a couple of the guys um, the, the other day. Like, we don't have, like, a ton of resources because we're a small, growing church. We don't have a ton of resources to go out and, and go on these big mission trips, yet we don't have the resources to do things like that. But guess what? I mean, this, this afternoon on Wednesday, November 1st, we went on a mission trip to India today. I'm serious. I got in the car after we were done soul winning, and I was like, we just went on a mission trip to India. And everyone's laughing. I'm like, we, that's exactly what we did right here in Fresno. There's entire neighborhoods of people from different countries here. And guess what? Some of those people are ready to get saved. Amen. Some of those people right now, all they need is for someone to go up and just show them the Bible, and they will just get saved. I mean, you talk about soul winning stories from this church. I mean, I heard this soul winning story from Sunday that was just, I mean, it's not unbelievable, but it, it was unbelievable, the soul winning story from Sunday that I heard, just people going out and just giving the gospel to somebody that was so happy to get saved that they went right back in their house, dragged their wife and their daughter out, and just says, like, here, now tell them. Amen. Those are, that's what Jesus is talking about in verse 35. He's saying, hey, don't wait four months. What if we would have waited four months? And that person would have moved away, or that wouldn't have happened. Talking about... Stories where, on, on Sunday, where somebody walks by a door, and then, oh, I think I know the guy that lives over there, and they text somebody that knows the person that goes, yeah, he's up now, go knock his door again. Knock his door, he gets saved. Amen. I mean, there's people ready right now. This is what Jesus is talking about, and he's talking to us. He's talking to us this evening. I mean, it's there. It's there. The, the, the whiteness of the fields is there, folks. Look, it's not everybody, but guess what? Some are, some are growing. Some are getting ready to reap. We're, some of them, some of them, and this is the one that we really need to not dismiss. Some of them we go out and we talk to people, we have a nice conversation with somebody. Maybe we just, we leave them with some ideas. Maybe they've never been asked the question. Think about this. I mean, how many people have you talked to where they've never even been asked the question, where you ask them a question, if you die today, do you know if you go to heaven? They're like, I don't know, good question. I've never really thought about that, or I think about that, 
but I don't have any idea. But then they don't really want to hear. But guess what? When you leave, now they're thinking about that. You know what you've done? You just planted. And now they're thinking and those wheels are turning. And guess what? There's no other answer. There's no other answer out there other than try to work your way to heaven, which isn't an answer. So look, some are growing. Some, some seeds are being sown today. Some seeds are being sown Saturday. Some seeds are being sown Sunday. And you know what? Maybe in a year we'll reap those. But guess what? You probably won't reap the same one that you sow. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he's saying somebody else is going to enter into that labor. So you go and you have a nice conversation. You make a decent impression on somebody. You show them that you know what you're talking about when it comes to the Bible. And you get to just start thinking about some things. Look, there's value there. And then some other soul winner is going to come along and he's going to enter into those labors that you started a year ago, two years ago. I've heard stories of people getting the gospel three years prior and then somebody else knocks their door again and gets them saved a, another year later or two years later. This is what Jesus is talking about here. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Seeds sown today will be reaped by so, you know, somebody else will reap them at another time in the future. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, just another thought on reaping and sowing here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse number 6. The Bible says this. It says, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So the Bible is saying that if you sow, if you go out and you plant a bunch of seeds... And you're never going to be the person that all you do is just plant seeds in your life. That's, that's kind of a nice little, little promise here. It's a nice way of looking at it anyway. You go out and you just sow seeds all the time. And look, you're going to get people saved. Because the Bible is saying if you go out and you sow abundantly, you are going to reap abundantly. But the Bible is saying if you don't go out and sow, I mean, this is soul winning motivation right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This is soul winning motivation for the person that goes out and just knocks, you know, 700 doors and has 700 doors slammed in his face. It has 700 people not get saved. This is, look, this is somebody that's just sowing and sowing and sowing and sowing. What you're doing is you're just racking up your reaping that's coming down the road is what you're doing. Because you're sowing bountifully and you're going to reap bountifully. It's a good promise here. So if you sow, you will reap, even though you may not reap what you sow. Not talking about that verse from the Bible, just talking about soul winning and planting seeds of the gospel. Turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. So Jesus here is talking about, let's look at verse 36 where he says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages. We haven't even gotten to the rewards yet. I'm just trying to give you the context of what Jesus is actually talking about here, and what Jesus is telling the disciples that they need to do. It says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. So Jesus is saying you're going to gather a certain type of fruit here. Look at verse number 2 of John chapter 15. Verse number 2 of John chapter 15. The Bible says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth fruit more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And then Now look at this. So he's talking about, by the branches, he's talking about us. He is the trunk, okay? He is the trunk. We're supposed to be abiding in the tree. We're the branches of the tree, and we're supposed to be bearing fruit, Jesus is saying. So Jesus is saying, you know, and this matches up with a sermon that we heard Sunday night from one of the men talking about you know, if we don't abide in Jesus, what's going to happen? But look at verse number four. It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. You ever notice that once you get into the things in the world, and you get, you know, get really concerned about things in the world, and the things in the world grab you and pull you away? You ever notice how you start to just have less and less interest in spiritual things? It's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, you need to be abiding in me. Why? So you can bear fruit. And he's saying, if you don't abide in me, it's not going to be possible to bear fruit. So if you get out and you get wrapped up in worldly things, you get wrapped up in sin, especially out in the world. He's like, you're not going to bear fruit. By stopping abiding in Jesus, you're just going to, and look, you know it's true. 
When you start to pay attention to and get into worldly things, especially sinful things, you will lose that desire. You'll lose that desire. Music is a perfect example of this, just a simple example. Is if you just go out and listen to a bunch of worldly music all week long, you're going to come to church and you're going to hear hymns and you're going to be like, ugh. You're going to have less interest in hymns. Why? Because it's going to rob that spiritual desire from you. Because you're not abiding in Jesus. It's going to rob your spirituality from you. And guess what? If you get that spirituality robbed from you, you're not going to bear fruit. And then what? He's going to purge you. So you bring forth more fruit. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. That's the goal. Much fruit. What kind of fruit? Fruit unto life eternal, Jesus says in John chapter 4. For without me, ye can do nothing. Can I just go out and just live a worldly life? Can I go? Why can't I go out? Why do I have to live this separated Christian life? Why can't I just go out and live the life that everybody else is living and just and still go to church on I'm just gonna I'm just gonna break my, my Christian life down to Sundays. I'm just gonna go to church Sunday morning and I'm gonna go soul winning Sunday afternoon. Pastor says that I should go soul winning once a week, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get worldly, I'm not gonna separate from anything, and I'm gonna go to church Sunday morning and I'm gonna go soul winning Sunday afternoon. That'll be I'll compartmentalize my Christian life. And then, like, it's not going to work. That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, you'll stop even wanting to do Sunday morning. You'll, it'll, it'll rob you. you. You can't have both. Because you can't have fruit without abiding in Jesus. That's what he's teaching in John chapter 15. And if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, as it is withered, and men gather them and cast into the fire, and they are burned. Oh, that means I go to hell. No, he's just talking. He's giving an analogy of a piece of wood. He's saying, if you don't abide in me, it's not going to work, folks. And he's saying, notice in verse number, this, this goes to the sermon on Sunday night, where we talked about idols of the heart. What's God going to do when you go out and you find these worldly things that are robbing your desire for him? What's he going to do? He's going to purge those things from you. So to, to plainly speak it and to, to put it on top of, um, I think it was Brother Max's sermon on Sunday night, God, you have an idol in your heart. You put an idol and you put something in front of God. God is going to destroy that thing. God's going to come after that thing and knock it off of that pedestal and get himself back up on that pedestal so you abide in him again. Why? Because it's all about fruit. That's why. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 6. Turn to Romans chapter 6. I think I've said this before, but it's always good to kind of, when we have these soul winning verses, sometimes it's good to go, and we've, we've read these soul winning verses so many times, it's good to go and kind of just re-remind ourselves of the context of the verses. Romans 6.23 is like our go-to, you know, one of our, it's like the core of our soul winning here, Romans 6.23. But let's go up to Romans 6, verse number 21, and let's just look, look, at, the, um, look, at, the, look at the context. Of Romans 6 23 the Bible says this it says what fruit had ye actually go to verse 20 it says for when you were the servants of sin ye were free from righteousness what fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed he's saying when before you were saved you were a servant of sin sin literally had you over death's barrel is what he is saying sin condemned you sin condemned you before you got saved you are a servant to it. Look, if you go and you're saved and you go become a servant of sin, you are voluntarily putting yourself into servitude. But it can't kill you. That's the difference. So he's saying in verse number um, 21, he's saying of these things, he's like, what fruit had ye in those things? None. He's saying you didn't have any fruit in those things that you're now ashamed of. Now that you know the Bible, you're saved, you're no longer a servant to those things. But what you, what you do know is there was no fruit there. For the end of those things is what? It's death. But now I'm being made free from sin. What does that mean? I'm made free. From, that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're going to achieve sinless perfection. Amen. It simply means that sin has no power over you anymore. Before it could kill you. Before it could send you to hell. Before it, it literally it, it, it condemned you to death. 
But now it has no power over you. You're freed from it through Jesus Christ. And become servants to God, ye have your what? Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So here's what Jesus is telling the disciples. You see that? You see that? What does, it say? What does Jesus say there? It says, or in, what does uh, Paul say there? He says, you have your fruit. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So look, you already have your fruit. Jesus is telling the disciples in John chapter 4, go get more. He's like, you have your fruit. You have your fruit unto holiness. You better abide in me, stay in me, and then you will be able to go, because you can only do it by abiding in me. That's what he's explaining in John chapter 15. You can't do it on your own. You can only do it if you're abiding in me. You have your fruit. Go get more. It's ready to be picked now. The fruit is, the, the fruit is ready. The harvest is ready. Now go to verse number 36 of John chapter 4. I mean, this is a pretty important, I mean, they're all like, did you get something to eat? Did you get something to eat, Jesus? And this is what he's throwing at them. Can you imagine? I mean, they're just like, hey, we're going to take it easy for the night. It's time to just sit down, take a break, get some, get some food. And this is what Jesus is laying on them. He's laying some pretty heavy stuff on them right here. Look at verse number 36. And he that reapeth, look at this, receiveth wages. On top of all of this, on top of this, this idea that you are now freed from sin and you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life, eternal life, on top of the fact that you have your fruit of eternal life, God wants to reward you. Can you imagine? After all that he's done, given us eternal life, God wants to reward us. Now look, turn to Revelation chapter 20. The unsaved are going to be judged by their works. The Bible is very clear about this. You say, how could, how could God reward me? What would God reward me with? Why would God reward me? Does God owe me rewards? Look at Rome, or, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse number 12. Talking about the great white throne judgment here. I just want to show you that the unsaved are going to get what they want. They're going to be judged by their works. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The books are the Bible, by the way. The books are the Bible, and the book is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. In what? The Bible. According to their works. The unsaved are going to be judged by their works. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. But we will be rewarded by ours. You say, do I deserve that? No, you don't deserve that. But that's just what God's going to do. You don't deserve that. You don't deserve anything extra. We didn't deserve, the, the, we didn't deserve our fruit. And God's going to, he's just telling us, go get more fruit, and then I'm going to reward you for that. He's like, he that reapeth receiveth wages. Look at Matthew 16, 27. It says, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. That's talking about us when Jesus comes and gets us. He's going to reward us for what we have done here. Turn to Romans chapter 12. You say, but wait. You say, but wait. I thought, I thought that it was just my reasonable service to serve the Lord with my life. I didn't deserve to be saved. I didn't deserve anything but hell. I still don't deserve anything but hell. And I'm just happy that I'm saved. And I thought it was just my reasonable service to just do what God asked me to do, you know, to serve the God that saved me. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. He's telling you what you should do with your life. Amen. A living sacrifice. Like, as long as you're alive, this is what you should be doing. You should be sacrificing your life for God. You should be doing, using this body and this breath and these heartbeats for the Lord. Amen. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And that, look, if you sacrifice your life that God gave you and you serve God with your life, that's a, that's a reasonable, it doesn't say extraordinary. 
It says it's reasonable for you to do that. But what I'm trying to get you to see from John chapter 4 and John chapter 15 and many other places I'm going to show you in the Bible is that on top of that, God's going to reward you. Look, this isn't something that I think about or preach about a lot, but the Bible is very clear about it. God is going to reward us. But I think the most important thing that we need to take from this is we need to understand, this, this really kind of helps us understand the God that we serve. It really kind of gives us an idea of the type of God that we are serving here. I mean, God's got a bad name from a lot of wicked people that hate him. There's a lot of wicked people that hate God out there that say all kinds of stupid things about God. They don't even know who he is. Oh, God's uh, wrathful, and the God of the Bible is wrathful, and I mean, there's just all kinds of people out there. There's some, I guess there's some politician, which I, I could care less about, but he's making the news because he believes the Bible literally. What other way is there to believe, believe a book? Like when it says, you know, somebody died when they were 120 years old? I mean, how are you supposed to interpret that? Like, what does that really mean? Does that really mean 80 billion years or something? I mean, what? But the point is this. The point is this. God is being slandered left and right in our world today. But this is truly the God that we serve. And God is explaining here, I mean, think about this. God gives us eternal life. I mean, free. He gives us eternal life for nothing. He gives us eternal life and he then, he then wants you to ask for things. He's just ask me for stuff. God says that all over the Bible. He's like, just asking. He wants, to, he wants to give you things that you ask for, and then he wants to reward you. And guess what? He wants to reward you here and eternally. You're like, wow. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. I can read you verses on this all night long. He wants to reward you for doing his will. You know, and then he tells you, you know, if you do my will, you're going to suffer persecution. If you do my will, people aren't going to like it. If you do my will, you're going to have trouble. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you abide in Jesus, I mean, just let me break this down for you. You know, John chapter 15 was just saying, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. And then you're going to bear fruit. But then he comes out and tells, look, God tells us the whole truth here. He tells us the whole truth in the Bible. He says, if you abide in me, you're going to bear fruit. But you know what? You're going to suffer for it. You're going to get persecuted for it. But God is saying here, look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12. He says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Look, he's not just saying, he's not just saying when men beat you and cut your head off and, and do all these terrible things that I always read to you out of the martyr's mirror. That's not, he's like just that men are mad at you. That people are upset with you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So when people, you know, see that you're changing the way you do things, and you decide you're going to, you know, you got saved, and now you're going to abide in Jesus. See, look, the getting saved thing is one thing. But then, like, abiding in Jesus, that's really going to make people mad. You're going to, you're going to, he's, he's doing what? He's going to the church, some church, and, and like, they're telling him to, not do this and do this, and they're telling them what the Bible says. About they're, they're walking up and down the streets with Bibles. You know that? You know they go around, they knock on strangers' doors with Bibles in their hands? <laughs> Look, people are going to revile this. They're going to be upset. You say, why would that upset anybody? I don't know. Because the Bible says so. But what does it say? It says they're going to they're talk all kinds, of, they're going to lie about you. They're going to say you joined some cult. They're going to come up with all kinds of weird things to say about you. And, like, falsely. They're just going to make up stuff about you. And they're going to talk trash about you constantly when you're not there. He's saying then, what, what I mean, you sound, this, this is terrible. Then look at the next verse. Rejoice. Amen. And be exceeding glad. You're like, this is crazy. What? I'm supposed to, this is not pleasant. It's not pleasant when people talk trash about you. I mean, how would you like it if, like, someone just talked trash about you all the time? You know, just, like, it, it doesn't make you feel good when that happens. That somebody is just spreading lies about you. It's an upsetting thing to go through. 
But the Bible here is saying just it's going to happen. It's going to happen for my sake. It, look, if you're abiding in Jesus and they're doing it, look, if, if you're doing a bunch of bad stuff and that's why they're talking trash about you, that's different. But if you're abiding in Jesus, you're going to make people mad. They're going to say lies about you and they're going to make up all kinds of stuff and they're going to trash you. That's the way it is. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. And you know what? It's such a great trade. It's such a great trade to go through a little bit of nastiness here in this little time right here. And then great is your reward in what? In eternity. He's saying rejoice. So every single time, like maybe you need to remind yourself of this. Maybe you need to remind yourself when people are lying about you and they're trashing you, people get upset at you, and, you know, I mean, you go and you give the gospel to somebody and, and they get mad. At least we care. I mean, you know, I think we've all been there. You go and you, you try to find somebody that you love after you get saved and, and you give them the gospel. I think, I think this has all happened to every single person probably in this room. And you give them the gospel, and they get upset because you're telling them that you don't think that they're saved. Man, should I have, should I have, should I have worded that different? Or, or, or should I have maybe approached them differently? At least you told them. You know what I mean? Because you say, what offended them? Jesus offended them. The Bible offended them. That's it. So you're like, man, it's, it's a tough thing to go through. I get it. But hey, rejoice. I rejoice with you because great is your reward in heaven. You know, I had a friend, and I've told some of the guys from the church this before, but I had a friend who was a Baptist, and I was a Lutheran, and we used to talk religion and argue doctrine all the time. And I was a Lutheran, and he was a Baptist, and he never told me the gospel. He never told me one time that he thought I was unsaved. And I met him several years after I got saved, and I went and I had lunch with him. I was in that same state for some business trip, and I went and I had lunch with him, and I said, Lance, you knew I was unsaved, didn't you? And he said, yeah, I did. I was like, thanks a lot, bud. And I'm, ha, ha, we joked and we had lunch, but I was serious. Like, here I was unsaved. He knew it, and he never said anything to me. Why? He probably thought he, maybe he'd upset me. Probably would have upset me. You know, I was a faithful word, and that guy turned around and, and told me that I was unsaved. You know what? That upset me. I told my wife in the car. We got out of that church. I told my wife in the car. My wife just had this great time talking to all these ladies. She's like, that was great. I love that place. And I'm like, can you believe that guy, what he said to me? But thank God for that guy. Amen. And, you know, I was, I was, I've been on, the, on both sides of this. But the point is, nobody likes it. But you have to recognize why it's happening. If you're getting persecuted for the gospel, praise God. If you're getting persecuted because of the way, you know, you're separating things from your life, you're separating your family, you're protecting your children, praise God for that. Because great is your reward in heaven, and you know what? Great is your reward here. As you, as you protect your kids from this garbage that's out in this world today, I mean, that's our responsibility. And not only is it our responsibility, is it our reasonable service, but God's going to reward us in eternity for it. Amen. It's unbelievable. You know, like he's going to give us more on top of this? What in the world? This is the God we serve. Amen. It's awesome. Yeah, that's right. It's unbelievable. I want you to get the picture tonight of who we're dealing with. You know, we've got this, eternal life is a gift, folks. Eternal life is free. Like, we did nothing for that. And then God asked you to do the first works, to go out there and harvest. And yeah, it's reasonable. Because it only makes sense that we would go show other undeserving people what, how to freely get what we didn't deserve. That only makes sense. But then he rewards us for it. This is the God we serve. This is what I want you to see tonight. When you start to think, oh man, I've got to separate from all this stuff and abiding in Jesus and listening to the Bible and implementing all this stuff that pastor screams and yells about, it's tough. You know what? This is the God we serve. He wants to reward you for this. This is the kind of parent that you have. This is the kind of father that you have in heaven, which by the way, is a good example for the kind of father you should be. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13. I mean, 
Take this kind of father that we have and apply it to your own parenting skills. Try that. Because you know what? Look at Proverbs chapter 13. This is a great parenting philosophy, by the way, and you should do this. Look, you should chastise your children. Definitely. You should chastise your children. As a matter of fact, the Bible is so strong on this. Look at verse number 24. It says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. When's the last time you spanked your less than six-year-old? If you can't remember, you're not doing it right. If you don't spank your children, the Bible is saying, it's not talking about beating your children. It's talking about spanking your children to chasten them. It means you love them. The parent that just lets their children do whatever they want does not love their children. The Bible says chastening your children you know, could, will deliver their soul from hell. It's, ch it's chastening them so they will be obedient to you and they will have respect for you. And guess what? Guess who's going to give them the gospel? It's going to be you. Guess who they're going to want to ask how to get to heaven to? It's going to be you. So the Bible is very clear about chastening your children and very serious about it. But you know what? In Ephesians chapter 6, you know what it talks about? It talks about nurture. It talks about admonition in the Lord. So apply what God is doing here in John chapter 4, what he's telling us in John chapter 4, to your parenting. You should, you should reward positive behavior from your children. I mean, you, you can't just be this, this parent that's just this negative parent all the time. It's not going to work. This is the, these are the kind of parents that Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4 is talking about. They provoke their children to wrath. In the same verse that it uses the word nurture. This is the kind of parent that the kids can't win. This is the kind of parent that's, you know, just... It's all negative all the time. Look, if they do good, you got to let them know. Exactly. Reward what? Reward their labor. First of all, your kids should have labor. Your kids should have labor. They should have things to do. I mean, they should have things to take care of. Regular chores to do. You know what? You should reward that. This is why I've always given my kids an allowance. I've always given them, once my kids got to the age where they can actually start helping, around the house, they can start helping outside. Look, I make up stuff for them to do on a regular basis. There's a reason that we have animals is just so there's a responsibility there for the kids. But they should be, they should be rewarded for it. You know, I, once my kids really get to the age where they can actually help, you know, over the age of 10, 11, 12, where they're, I mean, they're actual real help to me. Look, I pay them for projects. If they come out and, and they work with me for eight hours, I, I pay them for that. You say, I don't, think you should, I don't care what anybody thinks because the Bible says you should reward that. You should reward that behavior. You should reward good labor. God does it for us. Why would I not reflect that back onto my children? If not, if you're just this negative, just like my way or the highway, look, you should be strict. Don't get me wrong. And you'd be better bordering on the side of too strict than not strict enough. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but you can't be all negative. You've got to reward the good stuff. And look, if you are strict and you do chastise like God says, there's going to be a lot of good stuff to reward. Don't forget that. It's God's attitude with us, and it should be a model. Turn to uh, Luke chapter 11. I'm going to give you one more example of this of, of God's attitude in this area. Look at Luke chapter 11. God gives us the analogy here of a friend or a good friend, okay? Look at Luke chapter 5, or Luke chapter 11 and verse number 5. I just want you to see this side of God that is available to you tonight. Look at Luke chapter 11 and verse number 5. The Bible says, and he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. We've all met this friend before. For a friend of mine is in, in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. So he's saying, you got a friend's knocking on your door. And he's saying, hey, I need some food. I got, I got another friend that just showed up at my house, and I got nothing. I got nothing in the refrigerator. This was Garrett before he got married. I shouldn't have said that. 
I mean, you go over to his house and you're like, hey, I'm like, oh man, I'm not gonna be here long. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but you got a friend, he shows up at a friend's house at midnight and he's like, I got somebody that's visiting and I got nothing to give him. Can I have three loaves of bread? It says, he from within, so the friend whose house it is that he's knocking on the door, he says, trouble me not. The door is now, now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. So he says, no, I'm not going to do it. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. This is so great right here. Importunity means like persistence and annoyance. Okay, so he's saying he's not going to give him the bread because he's his friend. He's going to give him the bread because he wants, he just, he's, he's, he's persistent and he just won't stop knocking on the door. He's just going to give him the bread like, here, just take it. Just go. And he's just going to get, how much bread do you want? He's going to give him as much as he wants. And God is using this as an analogy. And he says, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And then he says, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is his father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give, for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? He said, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more should your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? He's saying, even a bad friend would give the bread. Of course God's going to give it to you. All you have to do is ask. So God is just saying, ask for things. The point of the sermon tonight is God wants to give you good things. God wants to give you rewards in heaven and blessings here. This is not a prosperity gospel. This is the Bible right here. This is the God you serve. This is the God that saved you. This is the God that gave you free eternal life. And on top of that, ask that you go do these things. And then just tells me, and then just tells you, whatever you want, just ask for it. It's like you don't have things because you don't ask for things. Ask for things, and I'll give them to you. Even a bad friend will give things to something that it, to a friend that is asked. Even a bad friend. It's like, I'm your heavenly father. Why don't you just ask? We have this best friend. We have this heavenly father. And look, we just, but we won't do what he asks. This is the problem. We won't sacrifice our worldly desires in this life. We won't do it. Instead, you know, we, we won't sacrifice our worldly desires and, and, and serve him instead of trying to go out and make more money. We won't sacrifice anything in this life for him, yet he's saying, hey, d just do this. Give your body and give your life a sacrifice for me, and I'll give you everything. And if you don't have something, just ask for it, and I'll give it to you. But you have to abide in me. You have to do what I say. Yet we won't do it. We rob him instead. We, we refuse to serve him. We take away every opportunity that he has to give to us. This is what we do. When we embrace this world and, and, and the, the, the junk that it has to offer. And not only that, that, those worldly things will rob us. Not only will they rob us of that spiritual desire, it will cost others their fruit unto eternal life. All while you have yours, and I have mine. It, it's, it's so messed up when you look at it that way. And that's why God promises us that, you know what, when I do see you with those worldly things that is costing others that eternal fruit, I'm going to prune you of those worldly things. He promises us that, that he will do those, th those things. It makes no sense for a Christian to do this. That's what I'm trying to show you tonight. It makes no sense for a Christian not to just work as hard as he or she possibly can to abide in Christ. So God can just reward and reward, and bless, and bless, and rejoice in that persecution, it makes no sense. It is literally self-defeating for us not to abide in Christ. The carnal Christian is against himself. 
You see, this is the God that we serve. And this is Jesus' message over a sandwich. When the disciples just want to chill out, relax, and have something to eat. Instead, he drops this on him. He's like, no, go. you're going to gather fruit unto life eternal. You're going to receive wages, though. And then guess what? We are all, the last thing he says, we are all going to rejoice together. Look, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You say, you know what? I, I'd rather have fun here. You know, I know this is the guy. This is the guy that just doesn't really care how much he has in his savings account. He's just like, like I used to, I used to carpool with this guy. You know, he, I used to carpool with this guy. He had every toy you could possibly imagine. He's like, you know what? If I can afford the payment, I'm going to have it because I don't like my job. And as long as I got this job that can allow me to make these payments, I'm like, how can you sleep at night, man? You got like $250,000 in car loans. You know, how could, I mean, which is nothing these days, but this was, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was like a billion dollars, right? But I'm just saying, and he's just like, whatever, as long as I can afford the payment, I don't care. As long as I got a job, I don't care. This is the guy that doesn't care what's in his savings account as long as he's got, you know, some, some fun things that he's got right now. But guess what? The Bible is saying that we will regret this. If we live like that as Christians, we will regret it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. That means it will be made known. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. So this is saying that the foundation that we all have as saved believers is Jesus Christ. But you're going to build upon that foundation with that reasonable service that is your living sacrifice of your life. And what are you going to build on it? Are you going to build gold, silver, precious stones? You're going to put wood, hay, and stubble on it. It says, every work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 13 is basically saying is that God knows what you were doing for him and what you were doing for you. You're not going to fool God by pretending you were all spiritual when you're really out for yourself or doing whatever and just trying to like, you know, get the praise of men for things. He's like, all oh, that stuff's going to burn up because it's all going to be made manifest. It's going to be made known. Every single thing that you did, that's why you don't have to sit here and praise yourself. Every time, every time you help somebody out, every time you, you go and, and, and do something great for the Lord, you don't have to go announce it to everybody because God knows it'll be made, it's, made, it's going to be made manifest. It's going to be made known. It's, it, nothing's going to be not known. Look at verse number um, 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So this is what I've been telling you for the last 45 minutes, is that the good things, abiding in Christ, bearing that fruit, you're going to get rewarded for that. But this is the last thing I want to leave you with. You say, I just want to live this life. I'm saved. I'm happy with heaven. Look at verse 15. It says, if any man's work shall be burned... See, this is the real key right here. It says, he shall suffer loss. So it's saying, you're going to know. You're going to know that you should have done more. You're going to know that you didn't do a good job. You know, we always say that we want the God to say, you know, well done, a good and faithful servant. But if you weren't a faithful servant, you're going to know that. You're going to feel the loss of that. So just know who we serve. Jesus is telling, gather unto life eternal. You'll receive wages for it. And you're just like, man, this God's going to, he's going to give me rewards for this too. Eternal rewards too. Rewards that will last forever. And that's why we will all rejoice together. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.